good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar about business continuity. In common with so many people at this at this terrible time, we're making more and more use of webinars and video conferencing, and we wanted to share some of our knowledge about business continuity during this challenging time. Just before we do uh, start the content today, I've had a lot of questions about whether or not it's safe to use uh, Zoom, given the negative publicity that uh, has been around in the last few days. I think it is safe to use Zoom. There has been some guidance from GCHQ, and they said that they feel that it's safe for the cabinet um, to use Zoom. They advise against COBRA meetings and uh, the intelligence community using Zoom. And that's simply because the level of encryption that Zoom uses is, is whilst it's very high, it's not end-to-end -end encryption. But for the purposes of this webinar and for you using the software to interact with your clients, we think it's perfectly safe. Now, most of this webinar shall be presented by my colleague, Matt, along with my co-director and Amy and Steve and Mel and other colleagues, Matt's worked extremely hard on writing guidance and producing various documents and templates for our clients. I shall start though with a few introductory slides and shall also comment on some suggested free software, which may help you. Now you should have your microphone muted during this seminar. We would encourage you to send questions to us after the event this morning. We may have answered very similar queries beforehand. So before you do post your query to us, please check our COVID-19 page, which is showing on the slide, the, the address. And if you could send your questions to the following email address, we'd be grateful. That's alison at dglegal.co.uk. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, we suggest that you might want to drag the presenter video box to the corner of the screen so that you can see the slides clearly. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to look at whether or not um, you should have closed your office. We'll talk about managing homeworking, supporting existing clients, staff furloughs, suggested free software, government financial support, and business continuity plans. In terms of timings, we're thinking that this webinar will last around an hour. And you can see an example on that slide of one of our uh, templates that we've uh, written and uh, distributed to our clients around about a week ago. And I think we're on version three of that particular briefing. We'll come back to suggested templates a little bit later in the webinar. So keeping your business open and your office. Well, of course, this is probably obvious to you now, but by this stage, your office should probably be closed unless there's a very good reason for it to be open. The government's advice is clear that everybody should be working from home if that's possible. Keeping your office open when it's not absolutely essential, of course, puts you and others at risk. And of course, we've seen so much publicity about this on the news and certain key members getting into trouble um, for breaching the rules. So if your office is still open, then you need to ask yourself whether it's really necessary. If it is, then of course, you need to have as many staff as possible working from home. Could more staff be working from home? Of course, police will be reassured if staff working from, the off from home, um, <clears throat> sorry, police would be reassured if staff are working from the office because they are so-called key workers. Now you've probably seen this definition before of key workers in relation to the legal sector. Examples there tend to be more um, suited to criminal practitioners. And of course, we've been asked about whether or not this applies to civil practitioners too. And of course, the answer is yes. 
If you are required to attend court in person, then of course you are a key worker. Around about 43% of the courts remain open and many courts have already moved to using Skype and other video conferencing methods. I'll hand over to Matt now. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so, as David said, by this stage, and this there's a very good reason why your office um, should be open, it really should be closed. And that reflects not only the guidance issued by the government, but also the latest set of regulations. Uh, the regulations are very clear that no person should leave the place where they're living without reasonable excuse. The regulations do give certain reasonable excuses, and one is to travel for the purposes of work where it is not reasonably possible for that person to work or provide those services from the place that they were living. So, as David said, um, certain lawyers will fall into the class of key workers and um, it may be absolutely essential from time to time for individuals within your firms to either go into the office or to go to courts or other, um, other places where you're conducting proper urgent legal business. Um, certainly most of my clients now have their offices generally closed but they may be popping in for an hour a day one person popping in for an hour a day to sort the post and to just check on the place and to deal with things if you have staff going into the office you might want to think about issuing them with a letter explaining that they are um, required to go into the office purely for the limited purposes of um, checking urgent legal correspondence and scanning and distributing it to others. Obviously, if you can redirect post, then you need to think about doing that, but that may not be entirely possible. I suggest the letter because as we know, the police are taking a pretty random approach to some of this. And I'm certainly aware of people who've been stopped by the police and asked what their um, excuse for being away from the home is. So you might want to think about those things. If you have to keep the office open, and there may be situations where it's absolutely essential to have the office open, if not completely, certainly for periods of time, or to see particular clients, and I say all of this needs to be um, properly balancing the risk, because of course, uh, that every time you stop following the government's guidance about home working and opening offices, you're putting yourself, your staff and other people at risk, so this needs to be balanced. Uh, make sure that insofar as your staff or anybody else needs to use public transport, they avoid any non-essential use and if they do have to use public transport, they travel at times when it's less likely to be crowded. Clearly people in um, key roles, including the medical profession, will be using uh, public transport at other times, so you don't want to increase the risk to those who do have to travel. So again, um, whilst it might be convenient somebody to pop in to check the post early, it might be better if they did it a little bit later in the morning. Make sure that if you do have the office open at all, that you ensure you maintain the two metre social distancing rule um, in as far as is possible within the office. If you can get hold of any, then make sure you've got hand sanitizer available to be used in the office. Although I say that fully recognising that it's practically impossible to get hand sanitizer at the moment. If you can't get hand sanitizer, and regardless, you should have hand washing facilities um, in the office and make sure that anybody going into the office washes their hands regularly, regularly certainly on arrival when they leave uh, and at regular intervals. They want to make sure that they're minimising the risk to um, anybody else in the office, whether now or later. If you have to have appointments, they should, where possible, be conducted by phone or by video conference and only conducted face to face where there is no viable alternative and the matter is urgent. Now, many of us are finding that it is possible to conduct um, even urgent face to face meetings by telephone um, or by video conference. And I think um, far fewer face to face um, in person meetings are happening than one might have expected at this stage. Make sure you have an enhanced cleaning protocol in the office and that surfaces and other items are being disinfected uh, more regularly. There seems to be more and more evidence about the persistence of this virus on surfaces and other materials. So make sure you're following the most up-to-date government guidance on cleaning and you're doing it regularly. If you have waste bins, make sure they're emptied regularly as well because 
they may well be carrying something which contains the virus. Uh, it all sounds really odd, but it's just sensible things to be doing to minimise risk, but only obviously if you have to keep your office open. And of course, if anybody in your team, if anybody comes into the office, whether a client or otherwise, and they are showing symptoms of the virus, then they should leave immediately and follow the government's guidance to self-isolate um, for it will be seven to 14 days, depending on the nature of what's happened. Um, I think Boris Johnson had already been down with mild to moderate symptoms for several days before things deteriorated. So clearly this thing has a, a life um, cycle. So make sure they're, they're, they're not spreading this to anybody. And lastly, obviously undertake all of your normal health and safety checks in the context of the office. David, did you want to add anything? Uh, not at this point, no. Thanks. Brilliant. So by now, it's likely that many of your staff, um, certainly those who are still working, will be working from home, either exclusively or largely. So we've put down some things that you might want to think about. First and foremost, undertake a home work workplace risk assessment. Um, now, all of you probably reacted to this situation very quickly and closed your offices very quickly. And that meant that you probably didn't undertake risk assessments for each individual staff member and their particular circumstances. But now's the time to do that because you need to make sure that you're managing risk in an appropriate way. And we'll come back to how you can do that in, in a moment. In that context, you absolutely need to think about data security. Both the SRA and the Information Commissioner's offices will be realistic about data security, but they both expect solicitors to think carefully about ensuring that data remains secure even where their staff are working from home. Now, of course, um, different scenarios will offer different levels of potential data risk. So if you have a staff member who lives alone in a flat, then there's a very low likelihood of data risk, even if they're taking physical files home with them. The situation might be slightly different if you've got a staff member who lives in a shared flat and that they're living with non-family members and they're taking physical files with them. So you need to think about how you can manage data security in that context. Think about the technical um, situation of the individuals involved. Do they have the computers, printers and access to the software and appropriate phone access that they need? And obviously think about whether you need to give them advice. And David's going to talk a little later about software that might be useful in context of meetings and emails and other things. Uh, it's probably worth saying that you need to at least have a watching eye on the cost of this to your employees. So they may well be having to purchase stuff in order to work from home, which they wouldn't otherwise have purchased. So do think about the long term cost to your employees of this. Think about what will happen if your employee gets sick whilst in possession of client files. Now, some of you will be either exclusively or largely paperless in the way that you work, but some of you will still be dependent on paper files. And it's almost inevitable that your staff will have collected and taken paper files from the office to their homes. And obviously that creates a data risk, but it also creates a risk if those individuals get sick because you then need to think about how you can get hold of those files in order to continue urgent work for those clients. Remembering, of course, those files may well be by that stage um, have, have um, some of the, the virus on them. So you do need to think about those issues. Um, obviously, think about video conferencing. I think we have probably all of us been using Zoom and other options more in the last couple of weeks than we've ever used. Certainly, I've begun to wonder um, why most of the meetings I come to in London have been necessary and why I couldn't have done them um, from home over the years. So that's an issue to think about. Think carefully about supervision, particularly if you're running a legal aid contract. The LAA have made it very clear that they still expect effective supervision in accordance with the contract to carry on. Now, it's far more difficult to deal with effective supervision if you're not in the same office as the person or people that you supervise. And again, if the paper files are in people's homes, then you can't do file reviews in the way that you might do. So you need to think about what you can do in the context of proper supervision to ensure that, and this is a particular issue for more junior staff, the work they're doing is being supervised. Now that may well be 
more structured scheduled discussions with them it might well be that you ask them to send you um, particularly um, critical emails or letters for checking before they send them out in the way that you might not otherwise do it may be that you ask them to forward you or copy you into certain emails just so that you can look at things again just think about what's appropriate in the circumstances given the nature of the individual the nature of the cases and the complexity of what they're doing keep in touch with your staff um, i'm already seeing a number of individuals who i'm speaking with on, on a daily basis who are finding this incredibly isolating and difficult to deal with and so you need to make sure you're keeping in touch with your staff. Remember, if you're in the office, you probably see each other in the corridor or you'd stick your head around their, their office door or you'd bump into each other as you're making tea. And none of that stuff is happening. So you need to make a concerted effort to keep in touch with your staff. And lastly, think about billing because um, there's going to be an inevitable detrimental impact on income and cash flow as a result of this situation. And so if your staff are working at home or files, you need to make sure that they're recording their time in the way they ordinarily would do, but you have a process in place in the context of billing. So again, if you're working closely with cost drafting companies, have a chat with them to see what they've got in place to help you keep billing through this period. David, did you have any points to raise? Yeah, just one. Um, there's been a, a, number of, a number of firms have been thinking about and worrying about um, the safety of their equipment at work and whether or not they should bring them home. I think it really just depends on your individual scenario and the level of security you've got and uh, um, the, the safety of your particular area. I don't think there's any need to, to, to panic and remove all uh, PCs and equipment uh, just yet. Looking at us as, as, a, as an example, um, I've removed one computer, which I felt was a little bit vulnerable near an emergency exit. Um, I, I know that uh, one member of our staff has, has gone into the office before the lockdown to remove a monitor because it's easier using a large monitor than it is a laptop, etc. But I don't think there's any need to, uh, particularly if you have an alarm system and CCTV, remove all the equipment and, and, and bring that as part of your home working. Thanks, David. And another thing, I've been asked previously is, is whether or not um, staff working from home need to have locked cabinets and, and the answer is yes in a perfect world a locked cabinet where they could keep files is the best solution but that's in a perfect world and we're not in a perfect world at the moment so what you need to do is make sure that whatever solution they come up with to keep information um, confidential is the best and most robust one they can come up with in the circumstances. I think it's probably pretty hard to get hold of lockable filing cabinets at the moment. So that takes us back to the workplace risk assessment. Now, um, DG Legal have produced for each retainer clients a number of um, resources and those have already been circulated to retainer clients. Amongst them is a home working risk assessment checklist. Now this is a checklist that we intend you to use for each individual staff member to ensure that you've gone through the process of considering the particular risk associated with their home working. Now it's slightly time consuming to do but it's important that you do it because if something were to go wrong in the context of a data breach relating to documentation or information they held, the Information Commissioner's Office and the SRA would expect you to have gone through some process of evaluating and managing the risk associated with home working. We've also produced, and David's already referred to one of the documents, the guidance document produced, we've also produced a home working and adapted home working policy. David, we've produced a number of other resources as well. Do you want to have a quick mention of some of those? Yeah, so I think what needs to be on practitioners' checklists is consideration of whether any of the following documents um, is applicable. I mean, you've mentioned um, home working policy, home working risk assessment, also catast catastrophic event plan and event protocol. Um, of course, we've mentioned that we've produced guidance on business continuity. Also, template wording to say that you're still open for business, so you might want to have a detailed notice on your website. Um, perhaps a smaller notice, uh, maybe one piece of A4 on the outside of your door at work, and perhaps also 
something may be fairly brief in your email signature. And um, also, as Matt is going to go through in a few moments, um, a furlough leave agreement template. Brilliant, thank you, David. Um, supporting existing clients. Now, you need to be very careful that in the context of all of this, and obviously you are trying to manage multiple risks here, including particularly risks to your staff, but you need to make sure that you continue to provide appropriate levels of legal service to your existing clients as you are ethically bound to do. Um, there is guidance on both the Law Society and the SRA websites, which reminds us of our regulatory and ethical obligations to clients and therefore we need to think through what we're doing to support existing clients. So first and foremost, you need to let them know that your office, your firm, if not your physical office, is still open and working on their cases. Now, if that's not the case, if you have effectively stopped work, then you need to think about the impact on your clients' cases and what you can do to protect their positions. But first of all, let them know. Some of them will be very worried about this. Let them know about the impact of court closures or other adjournments or the move to online or video hearings. Um, a number of clients will have been expecting matters to have been resolved in hearings over the next several weeks and those hearings either may not take place at all or may take place in a very different way to the way they'd anticipated. So you need to think very carefully about how you manage their expectations. Certainly some of my family law clients have had very difficult conversations with clients who'd expected certain situations in relation to childcare to be resolved and those things are not likely to be resolved in the timescale they'd anticipated. So again, keep your clients up to date in terms of what's happening to their cases. Let them know how they can contact you. The way they contact you may have changed and you might need to manage their expectation. So instead of a, a, a principal number with a reception, they might now have to contact you by email or by um, individual mobile phone numbers with, their, with their, their, their lawyers. So make sure they know how to contact you. Let them know how they can get documents to you if needed. Now, of course, you want to discourage them from dropping stuff to the office um, or posting stuff to the office because that requires somebody to go in and collect it and scan it and circulate it uh, and also puts the clients at risk as they do those things. So insofar as you can, you might need to help them understand how they could photograph or scan and email documents to you if needed. Um, there are particular issues in relation to electronic signing of legal aid documents, but we'll come to that in a moment, um, certainly at least to mention. Make sure you can keep on top of their cases, including monitoring key dates and, and other limitations. And of course, make sure you're on top of the compliance issues around your cases. Those of you who are DG Legal Retainer clients will probably already be using a compliance caddy, which is a, a central online um, resource for all of your compliance and supervision needs. So that's an incredibly useful tool at the moment. Have a backup plan in case a staff member dealing with that case gets sick. Now you may well be in a position where you've furloughed some staff, and I'll come to that in a moment, uh, and where you've got a limited um, or skeleton staff team looking after the cases that are going through, but you have to be prepared if one or more of those individuals get sick and can't work on the cases. So you need to think about how you manage that situation. If you're doing legal aid work, the LAA are issuing um, fairly regular updates on their position in the context of both civil and criminal legal aid. The latest version, unless I've done another one this morning that I didn't notice, was published very late on, um, on Friday. It's dated Friday, but um, it certainly wasn't on their website when I finished work on Friday. So it obviously went up at some point. Um, and that deals with their expectations. Um, bluntly, it's very poorly drafted. It's difficult to understand. And I think there's a better version that we helped um, LAPG draft on their website and LAPG update that as appropriate. And the LAPG version gives a lot more detail about things like electronic signatures on legal aid documentation. David, did you want to add anything at this stage? No, thanks. So um, let's talk a bit about the Government Job Retention Scheme, which is the uh, staff furloughing. It's probably fair to say that we ran this webinar first um, a week or so ago and of all of the questions that came in during that webinar, the vast majority related to this scheme. 
And I think that's because everybody is thinking quite sensibly how they can um, reduce costs and survive. And of course, putting staff on furlough is going to be critical to that for many firms. Now, what I'm going to do at the moment is give you an overview. Because of the number of questions that we've had, there is brilliant um, guidance on the DG Legal website. And the government have also updated their own guidance in relation to the furlough scheme. And their own guidance clarifies some of the things that we felt were previously unclear in relation to this. Now, what I would say is that we still haven't seen the final set of rules. So we're still working on the government's guidance and on other guidance. Um, so let me run you through what it um, means in principle. Um, staff must be employed. So they must be on the PAYE scheme. Um, that includes, according to the government's latest guidance, salaried directors and salaried members of uh, limited liability partnerships. Um, but generally speaking, we're talking about staff who are paid through the PAYE scheme. They must be fully furloughed and cannot work part time. So if you're going to use this, you have to lay them off on a full time basis. They can't be working two days a week and laid off for three days a week. They have to be laid off completely. Your obligation is to continue paying your staff. Now, how much you pay your staff, whether it's the 80% that the government will contribute to the salary costs, obviously capped at £2,500, or whether it's more than that and up to their full salary is a matter of contract and discussion between you and your um, staff members. Um, you certainly can't, as far as we understand, pay your staff members at less than um, the amount you're claiming from the government in relation to the pay furlough scheme, um, but you must continue to pay your staff members. So you need to remember that you're going to continue to have the burden of paying them until you get the money back from the government, and that is going to have cash flow implications for you. The government payments won't be made until late April, as far as we understand it. There is more detail about how that scheme is going to work. Uh, in their latest set of guidance and on the information that you'll need to submit in order to make a claim but as far as I understand it the actual claimant mechanism isn't activated yet and payments won't be made until late April so again you're going to have to pay the money pending that point. The minimum period of furlough is three weeks. The latest set of guidance says that you can furlough a staff member, you can take them back on and then furlough them again but each period of furlough must be a minimum of three weeks. So you need to observe that. If it's not three weeks, it won't count as a furlough that qualifies for this scheme. The scheme will initially last for three months, but may well be extended. I guess we're all probably expecting this lockdown and the consequences of this to go on for much longer than originally anticipated. But obviously the government will also be balancing the financial consequences in deciding how long this scheme will last. So you need to keep an eye out for these things. Um, as I say, they haven't designed the final claiming or payment mechanism, but they have given more detail in their latest guidance on the information you will need to submit in relation to each individual claim. But we haven't seen the final rules. So I say that just to remind you that um, follow the guidance as closely as you can. Um, because ultimately what you don't want to do is find that you've um, exercised some level of discretion or thought you could do something uh, which subsequently turns out to invalidate your claim because that could have a significant impact on you. David, did you want to add anything at this stage? I just want to, to emphasise one of the things that you were pointing out about um, getting agreement from employees about the 80%. I, I think it's really important to, to be clear that the default position of employees receiving 80% of their salary is a myth. Um, whilst the government guidance is absolutely correct that they will pay 80%, of course, what we have to also take on board is employment contracts. And of course, it's highly unlikely that anybody will have a furlough clause in their employment contract. So therefore, the position is that they would receive 100% as, as a default. Uh, with the employer topping up the 20%. However, employers are perfectly free to say to employees, look, we can only afford to pay you 80%. Can we have your agreement to do that? And of course, employees are bound to almost certainly say yes, because the alternative 
may be redundancy. But it's important to have that conversation and to make sure that um, the, uh, the employee agrees to that by way of some kind of agreement. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, for those of you who still have questions on this, I'm pretty confident that almost every question you have has probably already been asked and may well be dealt with on the DG Legal website. So have a look at that before you send in any questions because we've got a lot of detail. And obviously look at the latest government guidance for employers on the furlough scheme because that, um, as I say, was updated, I think yesterday or the day before and is certainly much more useful than the first um, edition of it. So um, have a look at those documents. As David's already mentioned, um, we've actually probably best for you to speak about this david well yeah we're very very reluctant to draft anything which could be viewed as a legal agreement because we're management consultants and whilst we have got non-practicing solicitors and other lawyers who are practicing um dg legal is not authorized and regulated and we don't hold ourselves out to, to be to be lawyers so therefore we've never uh, drafted legal agreements in the past. However, this time we took an exception. We made an exception because we felt the situation was extraordinary. And when we drafted uh, the furlough leave agreements, um, it was towards the beginning um, of, of furlough, so we were going back about 10 days, and there was very few other templates out there on the internet. So we thought we should do it. We got a leading employment lawyer, Beverly Sunderland of Crossland Employment Solicitors to, to check the agreement and she made um, a few additions. Um, so we're pretty confident that the agreement's okay, but we still ask our clients to use it at their own risk. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Over to you again. Okay. Um, software we thought it'd be useful to share what software and other services we've been using whilst working from home which have been working really well for us and, and also for, for some of our clients first of all in relation um, to service um, we use a telecoms company that has always provided us with free calls to all law firms and all legal institutions in fact, I have one of their, our work phones uh, operating from home and it's worked incredibly well. We moved to this company um, for both calls and landlines, um, sorry, both calls and hardware as, as a result of a problem we had with a different telecoms company who were quoting us um, six to eight weeks to move floor in our office, whereas this company uh, called Legal TX um, enabled our move to happen in 24 hours. So if you want to know more about this company, um, just let me know and uh, I'll introduce you to them. They're a very, very good company. One other things, software, we developed DG Legal Email Checker to minimize the chance of emails going to the wrong recipient. The idea is that when you press the send button, a pop-up box lists the recipients and any documents attached and you check that you haven't made an error. If anybody wants the email checker software, it's completely free. You don't need to be a client. Um, um, we like to distribute it as widely as possible. It's something that uh, our clients have found to be useful. Of course, we use Zoom um, for larger um, internal video conferencing because the quality is better than Microsoft Teams at the moment. But of course, we use it for webinars too. Talking about Microsoft Teams, we found that to be absolutely brilliant for us. We've, I've never used it um, before this crisis, but it's been great for us. There are many features um, of which the chat feature is probably the one we use the most. That's a little bit like WhatsApp, but it's more sophisticated than WhatsApp. So you're able to attach documents. You're able to quickly move on to a video call if you want to. And there are a number of other neat features in there. That product is free if you are an Office 365 subscriber. So if you do have that, um, do have a look at it. It's really, really useful. Finally, um, our mail is an absolutely excellent product. Um, I should say before I explain what our mail is that um, 
we don't receive any kind of financial or other benefits. Um, so, so please don't think any of this is, is a sales pitch. Armel is a piece of software that plugs into Outlook and has some very neat features. Firstly, it enables you to encrypt emails with or without a password in Outlook. And it's the only system I've come across that can do this. I think the reason why encryption hasn't really taken off more widely is because people are put off by the need to have to use a code or a password. With Armel, you have the choice of whether or not to use a code or a password. Clients can reply to you and send an encrypted email back without having the software installed at their end. It tracks the journey the email has been on and proves that emails were sent and opened without the receiving party having to click on a button. And that's either amazing or a little bit scary, depending on your point of view. It also enables clients to easily sign and return a document or contract, or say a client care letter. When sending an email, you can use a side note to tell a colleague something you don't want the client to see. That might be particularly important, say, if the client uh, was particularly aggressive. You can also transfer huge files of up to one gigabyte. Usually when using Outlook, your limit is between 10 and 20 megabytes. There was a case in the employment tribunal last year where initially the claim was deemed to be out of time because um, the size of the documents attached to the email exceeded the amount, or I should, I should say the size of the documents allowed by the employment tribunal's servers. So using this technology would enable you to, to have as big as files as you want attached to your email. And finally, it comes with fraudulent email detection technology. So if an email comes from a party who is different to that uh, listed in the from box, then it will alert you. And you perhaps should also consider whether or not uh, your software provider is offering any kind of discounts. So for instance, uh, a piece of crime software called Bullseye is currently offering use of their crime app free of charge. Again, contact, contact me if you would like any further details. Or if you're coming to your end of your contract and you'd like some free advice about different software providers, what they're charging and who's popular, et cetera, just get in touch with us. Okay, back to you, Matt. Thank you. Cheers, David. Okay, uh, it's probably worth talking now about some of the government um, schemes that uh, are there to support um, law firms and businesses generally. Uh, it's worth mentioning initially the Legal Aid Agency, um, and it, it would be fair to say that to date the Legal Aid Agency um, haven't necessarily done as much as we would like. Um, they've reminded us about payments on account and they've um, slightly changed the provisions in relation to interim claims and hardship payments in the Crown Court. But they haven't done everything they absolutely should do. And as far as we can tell, they're not following or currently not following um, government guidance uh, to public sector um, commissioners in the context of making payments to sustain uh, cash flow during this relevant crisis. Now, um, LAP to the Law Society and others are putting huge pressure on the LAA to come up with some more helpful proposals in respect of um, supporting law firms through this process. Of course, you know, yes, you can make a payment on account claim, but all you're doing is um, taking costs that you might have otherwise later. Uh, we hope that they may um, increase the amount of a um, payment on account allowance or at least the frequency with which you can make claims. Um, we also think that they may be forced to consider reinstating um, standard monthly payments for some firms, but they've not announced either of those things and they are dragging their feet a bit. So keep an eye on the latest guidance from the LAA in terms of financial support. Obviously, all DG legal um, Retainer clients will get an immediate update from DG Legal when we become aware of significant changes. But also, if you're um, uh, members of LAPG, follow the LAPG website and follow the relevant people on Twitter. That's how I often find out about these things. So it's worth considering those. But of course, um, legal aid aside, um, 
there are other government support packages for business and it's worth probably talking through the ones which we think are likely to be most relevant. Um, we've already talked about the furlough scheme, the, the job retention scheme, so I'm not going to go into any more detail on that one. The um, current quarter or the previous quarter of VAT uh, was apparently deferred automatically, but only if you cancelled your direct debit, according to my accountant. So um, if you didn't cancel your direct debit and your VAT return was submitted, then the, the VAT would have been taken or will be taken if it hasn't already gone um, according to your normal standard uh, direct debit. So if you, if you haven't paid it, um, stop the direct debit and then of course you can defer it and pay it later in the year. You have to remember that deferring doesn't mean you don't have to pay it, it just means you don't have to pay it now. And if the government renew this for another quarter, that just means putting off your VAT payments further down the line. And of course, if there's a, an adverse impact on your income and cash flow as a result of a lack of new clients now, then you need to factor that into your planning. There is a small business grant scheme, um, which was a, a grant for those businesses receiving small business rates relief. Um, as we understand it, it is being administered by local authorities and um, theoretically the local authorities should be getting in touch with all businesses registered with them for small business rates relief and telling them how to join up with the scheme. David, you mentioned that you'd seen some issues around local authorities on this one. Yeah, absolutely. So whilst the government say that um, small businesses will receive the grant automatically that isn't necessarily quite uh, true for instance our local authority we're in we're in Loughborough and our local authority is Charnwood Charnwood uh, are saying that you have to complete a form the electronic form on their website and then the, the grants will be issued on a first come first served basis and what's quite worrying for us is that we only found out because um, our accountants knew so within a day of it being announced um, um, we were able certainly to um to to complete the form and get it on the website so you should check with your local authority if you're a small firm and uh, you're eligible for the 10k grant how your local authority is administering the scheme thank you david government back loans now um you will have all seen that the government's had to change its position a little bit on these over the last week or so because there were a large number of inquiries and very tiny take up and that's not surprising really because although these loans are backed by the government the reality is they're still lent on general commercial terms by the commercial lender that you go to um, and so for the purposes of, of preparing for this webinar i approached my bank which is one of the 40 approved lenders and I asked them what the process was and bluntly they wanted all of the same information that they would ordinarily want for a commercial loan plus a bit more so they wanted my last couple of years accounts they wanted my um, financial accounts for this year they wanted my business plan they wanted a detailed statement of the impact of COVID-19 on my business and um, although the loan is, is backed by the government in that they will guarantee the first 80% of the loan plus make the interest payments for the first 12 months um, ultimately you remain liable to repay the loan at whatever the prevailing interest rate is um, set by your bank the only good news is if you borrow less than 250,000 pounds the bank can't seek personal guarantees from the directors of the business but again if you're looking at this as an option and you may have to um, you do need to think about the fact that you've got to repay it and you may well see a drop in income down the line as, as a result of diminished client numbers over the next few weeks. So again, think about the impact of taking a loan on your future business. Um, self-employed, if you're self-employed, then there is a similar scheme to the government furlough scheme, but the government have made clear two things. One, the payments won't be sorted for the self-employed until after they've resolved the issue for employees. And secondly, um, for those of you that are running your own personal service or other companies, um, you will end up probably paying more tax down the line to pay for this. Um, the, the other thing which is always available is asking for time to pay. Now again, you may just be delaying the inevitable or deferring things, but it might help you with cash flow in the short term, particularly 
pending the receipt of money from the government in the context of the furlough scheme. So go to the um, HMRC and to your other creditors and ask for time to pay for things um, and then you can pay at some point in the future. Lastly, there is um, protection from eviction for commercial agencies, but that doesn't mean that you don't still have to pay your rent. And if you fall into significant areas, it doesn't mean that at some point in the future, your landlord may not be able to take steps to evict you. So the protection is for now, not forever. And you need to think about that. David, did you want to add anything? Well, just, just at the point about um, paying rent is, um, when I've had conversations about about rent and business continuity, which I know you're coming on to, uh, I've been surprised by the fact that um, practitioners have been quite shy about asking for uh, rent reductions um, or perhaps uh, rent holidays, etc. Obviously, it's a very difficult conversation to have, but if you're struggling, it's one of the things that you absolutely have to to think about. Yes, and, and actually you may get a better win. I've certainly had some clients think about asking for temporary rent reductions um, rather than rent holidays, because obviously um, it's better to have a, a lower rent for, or might be better depending on financial circumstances, to have a lower rent for a period than to uh, effectively be building another debt for the future. But it's definitely worth having those conversations, awkward or not, the, the time to have them is now. So business continuity planning. Um, this is something that uh, is worth considering because as somebody pointed out to me uh, off of the back of some training I'd done for them, I taught them how to do a business continuity plan, but not quite for the apocalypse. Now, I don't think this is necessarily the apocalypse, but I guess the point they were making is that when they were thinking about their business continuity plan, they were thinking about maybe a flood in their building or a power outage or some kind of IT dilemma that stopped them accessing things for a couple of days. They weren't assuming the wholesale closure of their offices and the transition for many weeks of all of their staff to home working, as well as laying off a number of their staff on the furlough scheme. So I think the issue here is many of us probably would not have anticipated um, the current situation or anything like it in the context of our business continuity planning. And of course, we're all learning that perhaps we should have done. Um, so. What you do need to think about is a number of obvious and practical things. How you can cope financially if this situation um, continues and continues for longer than anticipated, as it probably looks as if it will do. So you need to make sure that you are doing financial forecasting. Now, I would say as an absolute minimum, you should be doing an 18 month to 24 month cash flow forecast in order to understand the likely impact of this on your business because you may well be postponing payments, but you might also be looking at reduced income. Remember, if you take on a legal aid client today, you're not likely to get paid for the work you do over the next several months uh, until um, either you can make a payment on account application or until you can make a claim for final payment. So the impact of a, a lack of clients today may not be felt in terms of income for several months and you need to be able to forecast that and understand what that's telling you. Not least because you'll need it if you want to get a bank loan or if you want to come to sensible arrangements with some of those to whom you owe money. Think about where you're getting your clients from if your office is closed. It may be closed for longer than you anticipate. So you need to make sure that you're, if you're open for business, you're still offering business in a way that your clients understand. And that may well be by telephone or by email or by video conference. So this is an opportunity to stop your marketing. You might need to change your marketing and think about where your clients are coming from, because as I say, you still need their money or the money that you get for legal aid from them um, when this is all over. Are you fully using social media and advertising resources available to you? Certainly my Twitter profile has increased significantly over the last few weeks um, as I've um, taken to Twitter to have the kind of conversations that I might otherwise have been having in person with people. Think about what this is telling you when you have time about the way your firm works and how you run your firm. Uh, reflect on what you're learning as this goes ahead. So, you might want to think about whether or not you should be increasing the speed with which you move to paperless working. I've certainly got firms that have spoken to me over the last few weeks 
who rather wish they'd been a bit quicker with the move to paperless working than they have been because um, relying on paper files is causing them difficulties. Do you have the right technical solutions? Again, a number of firms have had to run out and buy lots of laptops or other um, pieces of kit in order to deal with this situation. And it makes you wonder about what you should be thinking when you next buy IT for your office. And I think transitioning to laptops is one of those things. A number of firms have been relying very heavily on standard desktop computers when actually they could perhaps have been reliant on laptops with secondary screens and keyboards. And that may well be something you need to think about moving forward. So there are things you can learn from this that might help your business. Of course, the other thing that we're all learning is that homeworking is possible and agile working is possible. And of course, longer term, both of those might enable your practice to reduce costs and potentially to attract staff who might not have been able to work for you had they been required to come to your office either full time or on a more regular basis. So I think we're probably all going to come out of this with a slightly changed approach um, to the way we all work and that probably opens up opportunities. Remember to think about what is or isn't working and think about how and whether to adapt your business continuity plan. Now, of course, if you're a DG Legal Retainer client, we work with you on your business continuity plan and we're already adapting our templates to accommodate scenarios like this better than, than, than previously, although I think the template we had was pretty darn good. Um, so we will work with all of our retainer clients, but if you're not, then think about um, whether you need to adapt your business continuity plan running forward. Sorry, I'm just going to go back. Uh, the last thing to think about is, is considering your risk, um, your risk register. At this point in time, you probably need to think about the several principal risks that will adversely impact your business. And that might be lack of clients. It might be lack of income. It might be staff sickness. It might be a number of things. But if you're not already thinking about it, identify your principal risks and think about how you are managing and mitigating those risks um, should they materialise during this period. Again, you don't need to go into uh, minute detail because you'll probably find there's only half a dozen, eight things that are absolutely critical to your firm. But if you've got an eye on them and if you're watching them, and if you've got a plan for dealing with them, if they come into, um, if they materialise, then you're gonna be better placed than being caught out by these things. David, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, um, just 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 a couple of things really. Um, firstly, just thinking about um, other um, other webinars, things that uh, people that have impressed us, etc. I'd encourage you to have a look at um, Crossland Solicitors websites. Um, they've been also doing a lot of good Q and A stuff with COVID nineteen, and they're very good at uh, employment law. Likewise, if anybody listening has any suggestions that they'd like to share in terms of things that they've come across which have been particularly helpful, please um, t let us know by email and uh, we'll, we'll circulate that. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, other, other webinars that we are currently working on. So, for instance, we have pretty much finished producing uh, a webinar covering the SRA's uh, transparency rules. We did a survey last month and we found that 53 out of 54 firms that we surveyed were not following the transparency rules. And that's mainly because of a misunderstanding that many practitioners think that this is all about price. And that's simply not the case. There's lots of rules in relation to things such as the SRA's digital badge, uh, complaints etc so we feel a webinar on that area is important uh, this is a good opportunity to make sure that um, we're getting our compliance house in order we will also um, be doing a webinar we think on uh, any changes to the rules in relation to the signing and witnessing of key documents for example wills of course in this very very unusual time um, individuals are thinking much more about wills, powers of attorney, etc. 
So this is an opportunity for practitioners to talk to their clients about whether or not they've made a will and if they have any special offers to obviously publicise those. But of course the difficulty with wills is that the present legal position is that you have to have the will signed using a wet signature and likewise it has to be witnessed with a wet signature. And it's likely we think that that's going to be changing in the very, very near future. We know that the MOJ is in discussions about this and as and when or if and when it happens, we'll certainly do a short webinar on that. And we're also considering uh, doing a, a, a webinar about marketing, just sharing lessons about what's working, what isn't working, etc. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much for listening. Just a reminder that any FAQs should be addressed to Alison at dglegal.co.uk. And thank you very much again for giving uh, us an hour of your time. And we look forward to being in touch again soon. Thank you.